Thank you very much, Tim, for such a warm welcome. And it's so great to be back in Traverse City, my hometown. I do have to say the last time um, I came home, I wasn't quite this nervous. <laughs> so, but it is terrific to be back. I would ask that you take a moment and imagine. Start by imagining that you're in your car, you're coming home from a long day at the office. You've got your radio playing and you're approaching an intersection just as another car comes careening toward the intersection running the red light. And imagine that you don't see the car. The good news is that your car sees it coming, senses it, and puts the brakes on, braking automatically. Now after that long, harrowing ride home, you decide to go out for a run. So you strap the health sensor to your wrist, and not only does it monitor your heart and your steps, but it's transmitting that information, that health information, directly back to your doctor. You come home from your run, you head in, look at your cell phone, and the biometric sensor in your dad's heart medication has indicated that he's taken his daily meds, so you're relieved. You look then at the counter and you notice your check, you endorse the check, snap it with your, with your cell phone and upload it directly to your bank account. Now, some of this might sound like science fiction, but it's not, it's real. Imagine now a world that's globally connected, all online, with equal access to the power of the internet. Imagine also that equal numbers of men and women, female sci computer scientists and male technologists, equal numbers are imagining and creating and developing this technology. Like I said, it's, it's not, um, this is not unreal. This is actually in pilot, these technologies are in pilot or in use today all except for one, the one part about equal numbers of men and women. That's the part that really is science fiction. So what I would actually like to talk about today is why so few young women, despite the opportunities in technology, why so few young women are actually deciding to enter, to enter the field? And um, more importantly, what can we do to stem the tide? There was a beautiful setup by Jim already about the economy, so I don't need to go into any details. We're still coming out of the worst recession that we've seen in 70 years, and unemployment, underemployment, critical issues that Jim addressed already. But the great news is there is opportunity, and technology is opportunity. Technology is in virtually every aspect of the global economy today. We need technologists. And um, as I mentioned, the sad thing is not only is technology the fastest growing industry and one of the highest paying industries, it's growing at two times the rate of other, other um, careers. And there will be 1.5 million jobs available in the US in technology in the next two years. My question is, will there be any takers? Where will the girls be? Now, this is my daughter, Sophie. So to her grandpa and grandma in their jummy in the room, there's Sophie, she's my sixth grader. I don't know how many of you in the audience have college age kids. My Sophie is exiting sixth grade and um, she's got the whole world ahead of her. She's excited about summer vacation. She's thinking about swimming. She's thinking about her friends. She is not thinking about the harsh realities of the job market, but I am. And I'm not sure how many of you may have college graduates who have great new jobs. That's wonderful. Some of you may actually be worried. But the good news is there are happy graduates. And they're happy, this graduate is happy because she has opportunity. She has choices ahead of her. And those choices come from having a terrific career, a career that's on the upswing. So the good news is what this graduate has is there for the taking. Any child with a vibrant mind, determination, it's there for the taking. 
So despite the demand, interest, as I mentioned earlier, interest is declining. And um, in fact, it's, it's declining dramatically. And what, what kind of struck me as I've had a 30 year, almost 30 year career in technology, what struck me is I didn't get this. I didn't understand this until about a year ago. I was asked uh, to join our company's Diversity and Inclusion Council, and I began to study the numbers. And when I began to study the numbers, I got really nervous, because not only did I have a pull-through issue, so not enough women in senior leadership positions, we know the stats, 15 CEOs in Fortune 500, not 15%, 15, period. 8% of top corporate positions are, are occupied by women, 8%. So we have a pull-through issue, but we also have a pipeline issue. And in computer science, one of the most opportune areas for growth, it, we have a significant issue. So despite not ever personally feeling a, a, a glass ceiling, I feel a little guilty to say that today to, to some of my um, younger generation, the headline is, our young people are missing out on a tremendous opportunity. And we're missing out too. Teams of comprised of equal numbers of men and women perform better. Statistics show it. And in fact, companies with higher numbers of women in leadership roles have a 30% better return on investment to the stakeholders. So this is ROI. This is not just the right thing to do, it's return on investment. So let's talk about what's driving the gap because before we can actually solve for this, we need to, to really understand what is behind um, the decline. So I'll talk about two things. There are so many, but I'm gonna just pick two. One is education. So it starts um, with the gap in the curriculum. So you might be surprised, as I was, when I started studying this to learn that um, schools in the high school level offering introductory computer science, has that the computer science curriculum has declined 17% of the last 10 years. Advanced placement, 37%. So schools offering advanced placement computer science has declined 37% over the last 10 years. It is really dramatic. So I'm worried. Um, let's talk a little bit about confidence. This, um, in fact, I've been learning a lot more about confidence lately. There's a, a recent new book um, out by Caddy Kay and uh, Claire Shipman journalists who talk about the confidence gap between the sexes. And I think about this as, you know, as young boys are taught to compete, it's okay to be unruly in the classroom. It's just boys, boys being boys. Girls were taught to be good, were taught to be quiet. She's such a good girl. She's so good in class. So as women, or as actually as men, um, we're, we're actually striving, and men are taught to take risks. Women, on the other hand, are taught to be perfect, to be really perfect. So I think that's one of the issues um, that we have, is as we think about our teachers, our teachers can help. Sometimes unconsciously, we're teaching our boys that they're better inclined toward math and science that it's just natural, it's more natural for boys, less natural for girls. Blue is for boys, pink is for girls. So I think that's a significant issue, is confidence, girls feeling like they can compete, feeling like it's okay to be maybe the only one or two in the classroom filled with boys. It's scary. And peer pressure, we can't forget how that plays in confidence. Peer pressure for girls in the teens, we, all, we, we know that. That's, that's a significant challenge. So um, now we turn to what we can do. One of the most important pieces of this. There's a lot that we can do. And it may seem daunting, but there's a role that all of us have to play here. And I'd actually like to start with our best champions, and that's our teachers. It takes great teachers. Uh, I don't know if Diane Walker is here. I had a great teacher in seventh grade, and Diane Walker, Mrs. D 
Diane Walker, taught me that I was good at math. She told me I was good at math, and guess what, I believed her. <laughs> so thank you, Mrs. Walker. Teachers can really help with confidence. Remember, confidence does not equal ability. All right, now for the personal side. This is me at age 10. The reason I'm sharing my picture, um, it's not always easy to put your picture up there, but the reason I'm sharing it, this was a very formative year for me. As I think back um, to when I was 10, um, it was formative for a couple of reasons, um, one being this was the first year I clearly could do my own hair. <laughs> I think I'm maybe channeling Marsha Brady or something, I'm not sure. But um, really, it was formative for, one, for, for two reasons. One was um, I actually competed in the all-city track meet. This was in grade school. And I remember the feeling like it was yesterday of getting a ribbon, of being good at something. And I remember how inspiring that feeling was. It's, it's like right right here, still. So I look at this and I'm, ha I'm happy, because that was a happy, happy time. I also um, think of this as the year that my dad was um, very famous in the neighborhood for building our Halloween costumes. And I was, we were, my brothers uh, John and Josh and I, were always the lucky ones to have these awesome costumes that nobody else had. This was the year, the first year of the IBM PC. That's what we were. <laughs> John and Katrina were the IBM PC, so that was, that was super cool, loved it. So legislators, policymakers, you have a role too. You can ensure that computer science is part of the every curriculum, part of the core curriculum. And um, Michigan, congratulations, you are one of 20 states who actually allows for computer science to count as a math or science credit toward graduation, so thank you. Now the next step is make sure it's a requirement, not just counts toward, is a requirement for graduation. We have to have bright, young people creating the technology they will be the biggest users of tomorrow. It's just an absolute must for us. Corporate leaders, so now it's my turn. <laughs> um, what are we doing? There is so much that we can do. One thing that Bank of America is doing, and I'm so proud of, proud of this, among many other things, is we, in a joint sponsorship, with the National Center for Women and in Information Technology, a nonprofit, we jointly sponsor a, an award. It's called the Aspirations in Computing Award. And it is for high school girls who are passionate and um, interested in computer science and show an affinity toward it. And in conjunction with our colleagues at uh, Bloomberg Microsoft and HP, we have given out 3,300 awards to high school girls to give further encouragement and 165 educators for their um, support and their encouragement of, of the girls. So this is something I'm really proud about. And you all who are engaged, um, my corporate peers, can, can do anything from uh, internships, scholarships, sponsorships, just mentoring. It's really important. And now to the girls. I know we've got uh, the high schools simulcast. That is one of the most exciting things that I could think about um, in preparing. And to the girls, you know, I just ask you to imagine what it would be like to be part of creating the solutions for the biggest problems that we face in society, in secu you know, information security, corporate security, and uh, national security. These are big jobs. In medicine, um, these are terrific opportunities for you to play a role. Um, just give it a try. S step your foot out. If nothing's offered in your high school, uh, look at NMC, look at the local college. It is a tremendous set of resources for us. Take a summer camp. Um, those are all opportunities. You have everything inside of you, girls. You have everything inside of you to be whoever you want to be. And I know that. So. Um, Last, I want to talk about two game changers. And I just want you to think about imagining. Kalia Broswell, let's see if we can find Kalia, and Ivana Gutierrez are two awards for aspirations winners. And I was so excited to get to know uh, Kalia and Ivana over the last 
uh, period of time. Um, Kalia is actually now a master's, uh, she's getting her master's in computer science at NC State, and Ivana is a junior at um, UNC Charlotte, and University of North Carolina in Charlotte. And um, the reason I highlight these girls is not for their vast accomplishments in high school to win this award, and they go on forever. It's really because they have a common thread. And the common thread for these two girls is that they had great, great inspiration and encouragement from parents and teachers. They had hands-on opportunity to actually try technology the way it's actually used. So not spreadsheets and word processing but they actually got to try building robots. They got to try building websites. Not only try, they did it actually for, for companies who hired them to build websites for them. And these girls are tremendous. I'm really proud of them. And the game-changing part for me, as I think about Kalia and Ivana, is that they are paying it forward. So they didn't stop with the accolades and go off to school and focus on themselves. They're actually hosting summer camps. They got grants from NCWIT, and um, they are hosting summer camps for girls just like themselves, hoping to inspire and encourage them in technology. They are changing the game. They're not gonna sit back and realize that it's okay that they were the only one in the class, that Kalia was the only African-American female to graduate from computer science at NC State in her, in her year. They're not gonna sit back and let that be okay. They're changing the game. So to leave you, I'm going to leave you with a quote. We've recently formed a partnership with the Khan Academy, and we're offering uh, financial education for free over the web. And Saul recently attended a, uh, a meeting with some of us and shared one of the most profound but simple comments um, that I just thought I would leave you with. We will solve the world's problems faster when we increase the number of people solving them. We will solve the world's problems when we increase the number of people solving them. And I believe that we need more people, including our girls, solving the world's problems. I'd like to start by getting them interested. Thank you very much.